All right. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind folks that uh, Josh has an excellent looking article for us to read that we're going to do on the 30th. So uh, it's in two weeks. We've still got a little time here, but uh, I'll post the link from the Etherpad into the chat window. Uh, second. There we go. So just a reminder that sometime, possibly the day before, if you're like me, uh, try to read the article. Um, all right. So pull request this week. Not a whole lot of new stuff. Uh, I didn't actually see anything that looked particularly relevant that was new. Um, <clears throat> but we did have uh, a pull request from Radic that closed. Uh, regarding optimizing carriage handling and bufferless C-string. Um, Ilya did the review on that one and uh, proved it and merged it. That's good. Uh, we had four PRs that have been updated, at least in the ones that I was looking at. Um, this ongoing OSD compression bypass PR, uh, Casey had done a review on that. And it looks like now Eric has been testing it and said that during testing he was seeing a lot of errors. So uh, that is going to be ongoing, I think. Uh, not quite ready. That's just, uh, that's just noise from the OGW suite. I don't think there's an issue with the PR itself. Oh, good. Okay. Cool. Any, any other info on that, Casey? Like, is it otherwise, is it looking like it's ready to go? Yeah, I'm happy with it. Cool. All right. Um, this blue FS fine green locking from Adam, uh, that uh, I think that we're is still... no longer DNM, in, and oh. now in addition, it is required to order fix for blue FS. Uh, I know the one uh, spillover on runway in some cases. I know spillover PR is that. Uh, I don't know if I've got that one listed here. Can you happen to you have a uh, that's, that a, that's a fix, not a performance issue. Okay. So just, just <clears throat> that probably explains why I never added it in here. Um, okay. Very good. Um, do you have somebody uh, to review that one? No, not not really. Yeah, that's going to be a tough. That, that's a pesky PR. It basically revamps entire BlueFS. And I wasn't, well, I was really hesitant to push for it, but then I fixed the bug that a problem that we never could have really fixed with that. and. That really, in my mind, put more pressure on this PR. I think we should try to rope Igor into looking at it, or Tage, if you want to. Which one? Is uh, it? This this is uh, forty two zero nine nine. I'll okay. put the link in the chat uh, right here. If I remember right, Adam, this came out of Majian Peng's uh, uh, attempt at doing something kind of similar, right? Um, exactly. Majian Peng just made a forcible um, release of lock just inside uh, uh, read, uh, no, write, to be able for others to go, and that really had a nasty side effects, and we decided that we really should uh, fix the locks and because yeah. it really gives um, improvement from BlueFS buffer IO when in the same time there are compactions and uh, some other actual writes and you can see on the performance uh, interaction on locks in that, that area. Yeah, yeah, I do remember Majian Peng's PR looked 
I mean, it, the performance was nice out of it, but it was scary. I have not looked at your PR at all, but it's pretty complex. And it's scary, yeah, it's very long. And... Yeah. What do you think, Sage? Are you having interest in, in reviewing this? I'm just looking at it now, I mean, it's been a long time since I've looked at this. But I think Igor yeah. would be a better reviewer. But um, Yeah, okay. I shouldn't think that I can. The, yeah, the, the first attempt at this, it was not safe. Um, this one might be safe. I can review this. I can review it. Okay. I mean, it's uh, safe enough that now <clears throat> it is possible just if we go uh, in a corner case that we do not have a space or runway space for blue FS lock, we can just stop and everything still we having the proper locks, we can now allocate and rewrite just from the scratch um, blue FS log, which previously was just impossible to do safely. All right. Well, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Sage. That's that's an exciting one. If we can, if we we can convince ourselves and believe that this is a good idea, then I think this will be a nice win. Um, in okay. any case, I wouldn't like to uh, merge it before uh, Gabby, me and Gabby fix that sporadic issues with no column B PR because that would be a very problematic uh, if we had two delicate yeah. errors merged at the same time. Yeah, I, I hear you on that one. I, I'm, I think it's not, not a bad idea to get that worked out first. All right. Uh, next, uh, Kifu's PR. The uh, updates our version of the RocksDB LRU cache to conform to the new, or, or to allow it to conform to the new version in RocksDB 6.22.1. Um, we agreed that we don't also want to update RocksDB yet. But that PR so far looks like it's fairly benign. Um, it still works with the current version we're on and then potentially allows us to upgrade RocksDB. I've been running some perf tests on that just to make sure that there are no in, in, uh, regressions introduced. Um, it, it looks fine so far. Um, I did also try upgrading to RocksDB 6.23.2 based on Kifu's commit. Um, it's having com compilation issues with uh, uh, the IOU ring stuff that it now includes. Um, I'm sure it's probably just a bug in the the uh, like our CMake uh, stuff, but um, I didn't look too closely at it. So I think we'll we'll just wait on RocksDB upgrade since I don't want to rush into that anyway. It sounds like no one else does either. Um, more generally related to that PR. Uh, Josh had recommended talking to Ceph maintainers. Um, this all resulted from a maintainer wanting to use kind of a cutting edge RocksDB to compile Ceph. I don't know what they were going to use it for, but um, kind of given the issues we've had in the past with adopting RocksDB too fast, um, even releases, like with the dramatic changes that they made in their, their, um, their, their right path, or, or um, like how they they read from cache versus how they read from disk with read ahead. Uh, I mean that code has changed multiple times in the last couple of years. So it's I think we need to start getting a little bit more careful about how quickly we we just jump on the new RocksDB releases. But anyway, that's a, a different discussion. So uh, probably probably try have that on stuff stuff maintainers list. Um, uh, the only other one here updated, uh, the cache binning, my cache binning PR. Uh, Niha mentioned whether or not we want to get this in for Quincy. I talked to Adam a little bit about this about a week ago, maybe. Um, 
I just got a couple of other ideas for doing something a little different, but you know we're we're all kind of in a time crunch here. This code already more or less exists, it just needs to be uh, rebased again, and then probably go through a lot more testing and analysis. So I I think I'm going to try to make it happen. Um, that might be the next thing I work on after finishing up the Kifu's thing. Um, well, I'm also looking on the on the wall clock profiling stuff, but um, anyway. Uh, that one, I don't, I don't want to let it go yet. Um, there's, I think there's still value there, so I'll, I'll probably try to get back to that soon. Um, lots of stuff under no movement. Adam, I know you've got a couple of different things here, but getting reviews is always tough. Um, Igor's not here, right? Oh, uh, so Adam, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit. Um, what do you think we should do about cache trimming? We've had both your PR and Igor's PR sitting there for a couple months. Uh, I even forgot about that. I know, right? <laughs> that happens to me too. We should we should fix it though. Use one of your guys' PRs, I think. Yeah, let me let me review that quickly and then come with with weighted answer. Yeah, I mean it doesn't it doesn't have to happen right away, right? I mean we've been sitting on this for a while now, but we should do something. Okay, so let's uh, let's make it for the next uh, performance weekly. How about that? Sure, that sounds good. Um, then we've got the TC Malik uh, uh, thread cache settings PR, which do you know? It, was there anything that prevented us from doing that? Was there was there anything broken about it? Does it just need a review? Or as much as I could test it, it worked perfectly. But I only made an on local local tests. I did not check how it might influence. In some cases, just didn't test it on the utology even. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, my sharded cache for RGW. Um, I think Mark Kogan is taking that over. He said he was interested in doing that. So. Um, I, there's been no more discussion on my PR, but that doesn't mean he hasn't been working on it in the background. So um, I'll try to find out what the status of that is. Unless Casey, if you know. Yeah, he uh, he did sign up to take it over. He's been um, making a lot of progress um, looking into the performance regressions in the Beast front end, though. Oh, That's cool. That's more important. With that. Yeah, yeah how there, is that going? There isn't a PR for it but he's uh, added a ton of details to the tracker issue. If you want to track that in the etherpad, I can find a link. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I haven't even, we don't have anything in trackers here, but maybe that's a, start adding. It's linked in chat. You can put it wherever you want. But yeah, he captured some very detailed flame graphs, so it's a lot of data to consume, but I think that'll be really helpful. Oh, that's great. Nice. Wait, All right, I'll, I'll... The use of time out there is way more expensive than we expected it to be. Yeah, I assume there's just some polling or something. But, um... Cool. Well, hey, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look through that later, um, unless people are interested in looking through it now. 
Um, yeah, that's, that's great. All right. Um, I think, oh, new pull requests. Oh, good, the MDS ones made it in. I was actually just thinking that that, uh, that Zhang's uh, PRs probably, I missed those, but that's good. Who added those, if, I, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, Patrick, oh, good. Hey, uh, Patrick, are you, are, do you have a working mic? He said he got up at one point, but he's listening still. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see that now. Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I did notice uh, on the mailing list, Jung, uh, I sent a, a big email. Uh, talking about some of this. One of the things I was trying to understand based on his last email is he said that this doesn't apply to situations like in the uh, the IO500 MD test hard tests where you have multiple clients uh, putting many files into like a single directory. And I was trying to understand how that reconciled with this PR43125 that we've got under the new section now where we're randomly distributing dirt frags to multiple MBSs. I thought that would be like kind of exactly that case where you have um, lots of files for multiple clients with multiple dirt frags, you know, all in one directory, and then those dirt frags are distributed to many MBSs. That's actually kind of the situation I thought that would apply in. So I wanted to, um, to ask Jung or, or Patrick if, um, if they could kind of explain that more. Um, I'm here now. Uh, oh, hey, Patrick. I, good, good. Hey. I don't know, um, for the IO500 hard test, is that how large is the directory in that case? So usually in the hard test, you've got one directory. You've got an arbitrary number of, uh, of clients, and each client can do an arb like write out an arbitrary number of files. So um, the test is, is timed, and it's kind of up to you to define – um, how much to try to write out within that time limit. Um, it's actually even timed is a little bit incorrect. It's a minimum time, but no maximum time. So you can let it run for as long as you want, but it has to run for at least five minutes, if I remember correctly. Okay, do you recall offhand how many files we had in the directory, though? Quite a few. Um, I'm thinking we were doing probably around 20 to 30,000 file creates per second. And that was over like a five minute period. So whatever that works out to be. Uh, 20 seconds. to 30,000 file creates per second? That seems I high. I thought that's what I was able to get on the upper end. Maybe it was, I think typically it was quite a bit slower than that, but I think I managed to maybe get it up to that under certain scenarios. But I think anyways, maybe you did some pre-fragmentation of the directory. I think you also had some, yeah. some PR, which also spread out the dirt frags before running the test. Yeah, it's possible I'm misremembering because it's been a while. Um, let's just even say 10. Is 10 reasonable or five? I know I've hit yeah, that would, numbers that like would that be too. more reasonable. Um, okay. His this PR may help if we also add some tricks to pre-fragment the directory, but I think that requires hints from the client that may not be allowed by the IO500 testing yes. framework. Quite possibly. Um, we can we can set another it thing on we like can a... do is make the MDS a little smarter if it sees um, you know a lot of file creates in a directory. It could try to pre-fragment it, but I mean that will, you know that that can backfire for other cases where you know it's just adding a few files to a directory. Yeah, it looks like with the IO500 they let you do anything you want to the parent directory. So like whatever directory all these this stuff is going to end up in, the parent you can set whatever X adder flags you want on it, or you know other things you can you can do. Um, 
but it's the the individual subdirectories that they don't want you touching from from what I've seen. I see. So um, yeah, I'm sure there's some hints we could provide to the MDS through some X adders that would improve our performance there. Um, preemptively spreading the Durfrax or just doing this um, uh, sharding the metadata by spreading the Durfrags out randomly across MDSs uh, is, <laughs> I don't know, antithetical to the early MDS design for FFS. Yeah. I don't know how Sage really feels about it, but <laughs> it, it yeah, could be an interesting yeah. uh, config option. I was also thinking what would be nice, though I've gotten pushback from Jung in the past on this, is, is just providing a, a config change for, for a subtree similar to how we're using for ephemeral pinning, just to say, <laughs> You know, I want the metadata sharded this way. And the random ephemeral pins were kind of one idea in that regard, and so was the, the distributed ephemeral pins. If we could also yeah. do it for this case, we just say every Durfrag under the subtree should be sharded across MDSs, then um, that could be, you know, that, that, would, that would be something I'd be more willing to merge because I'm a little wary of of having such a large change in here. And plus, I, I haven't gone through any of this code. I assume there must be some kind of config for turning this on, because yeah. you wouldn't want it in the general case. You know, the, the dynamic subtree pinning, if we could figure out how to make it almost not DDoSed when you, you get so big, that seems to be where it really falls apart, is it, it can't. Um, actually distribute uh, subtrees properly, it, it you end up like failing lock acquisition and it just all like falls apart. If we can fix that, it might work better. I mean, it might work like, you know, well even, <laughs> um, but that, that's, that seems to be where it keeps like, you know, failing, at least in the things I was trying to do. Yeah. Um, we still have not had any like anybody who's really dug into the balance recently. So I'm, I'm sure there's lots of little things that can be done to improve it. Um, it, it wasn't even so much the balancer itself, though, it seemed. Like when I, I, I thought it was at first, but it seemed like it was had much more to do with this like global um, shared uh, uh, cache, right? Yeah, there's... Here's reasons why the, the migration might fail. Um, and yeah, so the balancer can also do some repetitive things that just doesn't make any real progress, but potentially messes up performance. Sage, I'm interested for your thoughts on these PRs. Yeah, I, I missed the beginning of the discussion until you mentioned my name, so I wasn't sure what I was likely to not do. Whatever, <laughs> I missed the first part. But. Um, are we looking at the, we're just looking at the list of. This we're is, looking at the list is... of PRs from Jung. Um, one of them adds, uh, well, I haven't looked at the code yet. I haven't seen how it's configured or turned on, but one of them randomly distributes every dirt frag in a subtree across them. Yes, it's using the new consistent hashing we have for ephemeral pinning. Like nested all the way down or just at one level? Everything. Yeah, that, <laughs> that seems like a bad idea to me. <laughs> um, but I think it avoids making subtrees because everything is is distributed. But yeah, um, I think it it probably has some nice performance characteristics for this this AIML workload. But um, you know, for general purpose file system use, it's it's really not very good. Yeah. It would be. It would only be within the directory that you've turned it on, though, right? That's what we think. Not not over, like from the root on down, or is it? Well, if we're just talking about one level, that would be distributed ephemeral pinning. It would. It still. It would still create subtrees, right? It would just like you don't because the number of MDSs can. Well, so Sage the Sage is basing this work on another PR, which is also in the list on this Etherpad. The uh, pulling the subtree map out of the MDS journal. Um, 
which is something Zheng was working on to improve the performance of the MDS when we have hundreds or thousands of subtrees. Because um, the subtree map is written out with every journal segment, which can get prohibitively right. expensive. Yeah. Um, and so he has a PR to pull that out. And this other stuff is based on that. I don't think, I think he was in the middle of reviewing the, the PR to remove the subtree map from the journal, but we haven't made progress on it since. Because of its size and with Jung leaving, I was a little concerned about merging that because it really yeah. just changed everything. Oh my God, it's huge. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's like a, a deeper question of which direction we want to go. If we really want to go in a direction where we have a bazillion subtrees, then something like this is necessary. But if instead the thinking is find a way to still keep the subtree map modestly or reasonably concise, then. Sajin, um, in those IO500 tests that we ran, it was subtree map encoding or journaling on the authoritative MBS that, and it's just like one directory with billions of files from lots of clients in it. That was, I mean, it's just awful. Yeah. So that's why Sean started trying to see if we could yeah. pull this out and do something with it. I mean, the subtree map also is like, if I remember, it's like, it's encoding the full inode, right? It's not just like, like it, I wonder if the subtree map could be more place also, or if it's not. Not journaling the full I know it's just like I know numbers because I know it'd be pretty compact. I'm not sure, but I, I all I know is Jung took a really detailed look at this and this is the direction he ran off into. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Oof. I had um one really minor PR that helps this a little bit, um, that merged a while back. Uh, it's it's not even directly related to this, it was um about like a pend hole and buffer list um, or refill append or buffer, sorry, uh, implementing dynamic append length, um, this thing. This this actually might help a little. <laughs> it's, it's kind of stupid, but it it is just taking care of like some of the work that was being done over and over again every time we were like encoding the subtree map. So we, we might get a little benefit out of this, but it's not really, it's just a Band-Aid. I mean, probably a small one anyway. Yeah, I wasn't, I, I mean, coming back to the subtree map though, like I, I wasn't really sure why it needs to be in every segment. I never really got a satisfactory answer from Zhang. You know, Sage? Why it needs to be in every segment? Yeah. Um, I think it's just so that um, the trimming logic doesn't have to be super careful. I mean, you best you have to when you start relay when you replay you have to um, have a subtree map so you are replaying you know what's authoritative whatever so that you can rebuild your cache appropriately. Um, and it was just simple to write the whole thing because I just assumed it was going to be small. Um, but as long as you eventually, as long as you don't trim too much so that when you start over, you don't have enough context, as long as you have enough context to do replay, then it'd be fine. So it'd just be a matter of working out what, what that context is. I, I mean, this new pull request is a week old, so is Junk still working on this? Like, what's he, what's he doing? It seems to be. Uh, Which is company is pull requests? The, the, the two, the, the, the ones one, that are in the, the randomly new distribute. Queue. It's a brand new pull request. Oh, yeah, those are brand new, and Jung just posted to the Ceph user and Ceph Devel list about these PRs he's been working on. He actually is at some Chinese startup, and they're doing AI ML stuff. I see. They're working on CephFS there. I see. Okay. So he's not really gone. <laughs> yeah, maybe different focus slightly, right? But Yeah, but he's still working on it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, maybe that is maybe that is the direction to go in. I mean, I guess I, my assumption was always that the the map would be small, but I think even if you have like a pretty conservative view of things, you would have multiple directories in the many directories in the file system that are um, hot, and so you're hashing 
even at that level. And so that would be in metadata servers for every one of those directories and M directories. That's like already a, um, a lot. So maybe this makes sense, but. I mean, they're, they're kind of I really different. Scared. Distinct... I get already so complicated. I'm just scared about making it more complicated. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think, I mean, all this work around like, okay, the ephemeral pinning code is not that complicated. Even the balancer itself is like not that, that complicated. But man, the whole cap system and the distributed cache, that's like awful. I tried to read through that code a... and I still don't understand yeah. it. It's, yeah, it's all built up on top of that. Yeah, the balancer is just a big, Ugly pile of heuristics, basically. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not, not too not terrible. It's not too bad. Um, I mean, you could like throw it away and rewrite it, and it like nothing would change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was that was the yeah. what I came down to too. It's like this, this, this like, doesn't really matter. This is pretty. <laughs> this is uh, fundamentally changing the way that like the replay dirty state I think is being tracked. I would assume. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think it maybe it depends on how much we trust Jung and his brain to like <laughs> be able to understand this. Probably mm -hmm. we should be, if five should make sure that uh, like at least one other human can understand <laughs> before committing to this path and that make sure it's not some yeah pipe dream. Um, whatever. So I'm I'm planning to go through these PRs, but especially once my my time frees up in the next month yeah. but uh yeah you know yeah we can't merge these without you know someone fully understanding them who who regularly is in uh, upstream yeah and maybe some plugged in upstream i mean jung, jung is is working on Seth, but he's not really um you know regularly doing or he's not a Seth fed stand up like he's not triaging yeah. bugs he's yeah I mean, it'd be nice if you showed up and stand up to like support these and move them through. But and maybe also the um, I don't know where the the testing stands, but um, having a set of tests that have like pretty large numbers of MDSs and a like a workload with like thrashing or something, just to like really push the the boundaries here, like aggressive trimming or I don't know whatever it is that we think is gonna. Um, the, the, the risk here, I would assume, not having actually read any of the pull, the pull requests, the risk I would assume would be if the um, the, the total subtree map state is spread over lots of different log segments, that we're like tracking that correctly so that we don't trim something um, such that we can't rebuild that state or that we don't have the important state before we need it. Um, and so things like aggressive log trimming or like wildly varying trimming, restarting the MDS, <laughs> making sure that if you restart the MDS and it has to rebuild everything and then go continue to trim that it doesn't lose something, all that stuff. Um, anyway. Do we do we have any kind of like reasonable path toward making some of this stuff like less complicated? Is there anything we can do to like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's so, it's so intense. <laughs> it's pretty intense. Um, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, th I think like it's just inherent in, in the, <laughs> yeah. Sure. It's inherent with the distributed cache with caps, the, the MDSs, the replication. Yeah. yeah. The trees, renaming, all that stuff is, right. is just adds. Um, but yeah, what Sage said, if, if it wanted to make it simpler, it would have to be, we'd probably have to go back to the drawing board with the architecture and think about how They're we not. might. Do it differently. Uh, yeah. All right, I gotta drop for another meeting. Bye, guys. But, All right, okay. see you, yep. See you later, Sage. Uh, Patrick, while you're here, I was, I was curious about the CephFS um, QoS efforts. I see that it goes the um, some activity on this one in the past uh, month, where um, I see that they're actually using this this in production now. Yeah, this is another giant PR that has not been reviewed yet. Yeah, okay. I was um, wondering if it, folks had gotten a chance to look at this much at all. Nope. It's it's on my list, which never stops growing. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Another one to, to add to, and maybe Patrick, I can help out on this, is um, implementing the memory auto-tuning for CephFS. I, I know that there's like that outstanding pair that's been there for a couple of years, but um, I could maybe try to actually get it using the same one, the priority cache like we're using for the other demons, if, if you think it'd be worthwhile. Well, I think the, the it's just coming back to the priority cache, it, the, the main challenge there is in dealing with the, the presence of capabilities, because you just can't drop items from the MDS cache without recalling the caps that may be pinning them. Um, yeah, the logic sure, there sure. is significantly more complicated than what the OSD does, which I assume can just drop things whenever it wants from the cache. Not, not really. Actually, this is all written with the idea that you're kind of like making suggestions more than demanding things. Does that make sense? Okay. So like, it, the whole architecture is based on you ask the the a particular cache what it wants at different like priority levels. It gives you back what it wants. Then we kind of go through this whole process of saying, okay, here's what you should get, but please, please do this. It's not like a, a you know immediately trying to revoke everything. It's like, okay, here's what you should try to target. And then we go through this iterative process where we look how much memory we're using. Then if we're still not under that, then we make new suggestions. And you might end up kind of like starving something that can release memory. But the whole goal is to really keep things as much as possible below some memory threshold, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, OK. I mean, it, it's... it's 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 worth looking at, and mostly it would just be, I assume, changing the LRU that we use for dentries and priority cache instead. Um, most of the memory tracking is is done through a a mempool, um, which I assume Perfect. works pretty similar to what you know, we already do with the OSD. Um, yeah, most likely what we do is, is the same thing we do in in the OSD which is basically just to make a really thin wrapper around your existing cache that implements, either add the interface to it or just make a thin wrapper around it that implements the, the priority cache calls that need to be made. And that will, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's fairly non-intrusive. Uh, it's certainly worth looking at. Right now, the, the one PR we have outstanding for the memory target is uh, something Siddharth was working on, the MDS memory target, which is supposed to be analogous to the OSD memory target. And that was really just some logic to set the MDS cache size according to what the MDS thinks it needs to be in order to stay at its target. Um, I'm, you know, you, the, the, he had some remaining work to do on that, and the PR became stale, so it just really needs to be revived. Um, and yeah. that, that's that's low hanging fruit as far as just getting that worked on, and then I think the priority cache would be a good next step. So the the priority cache basically incorporates like generic code for doing the same kind of thing. So that's what we use in the OSD and in the MON. And uh, I was hoping I might be able to get the RG, RGW guys to use it as well. But um, it you know it it I don't know in the MDS it might maybe it's more complicated and wouldn't work, but um, it might be a nice way to just kind of avoid having lots of independent implementations of the same thing. Yeah, agreed. Cool. I'll add that here. While I'm talking to you about that, do you guys, besides that, the one cache, do you guys have other uh, caches or buffers or anything that that need to be like regulated to keep the, the client the... does the libs ffs oh okay. source client um okay it the the cache management there is fairly simplistic in that it's trying to cap the number of inodes in cache if i recall correctly and assuming it hasn't been changed by someone in the last few years uh, of course, some things are pinned in cache because, for example, with Cephuse, it's going to get a reference to an inode, and then the kernel 
controls when it gets uh, released. Sure. The only way that actually we can um, force the kernel to release its references to an inode is to actually remount this defuse mount. So actually, it's got some cute logic when the wow. MDS revokes an inode capability, Tefuse will actually remount itself, um, causing the kernel to release all of its references. Uh, and, you know, this has actually been a long-standing problem with Tefuse because there's no great mechanism to tell the kernel, hey, I need you to drop this reference to this inode. We used to have some special API call internal to the kernel through Fuse to tell it to release a reference. Uh, but that got deprecated for kernel-y reasons. And then I think that left us with remounting. Although I think there's been some work on the next few version of Fuse to add some kind of support to do this again. But I haven't looked into that carefully. Sure. So um, in summary, the cache management in the client is simple, but also a little interesting. <laughs> was um was someone on the SubFS team was they were I think I remember someone was looking at Fuse in general, like trying to update stuff and I think that was Shubo. Okay. Are they still working on it? Not actively, no. Okay. Probably we do, we need someone to take another look at the updated Fuse interfaces and decide if there's something we can do differently to and just make things better. Yeah. Actually, that sounds like a good project for our new um, uh, CFS team member who uh, was an intern elsewhere at Red Hat and just joined the CFS team, uh, Miraj, to pitch that as a startup project for him. Cool. All right. Patrick, it was nice to have you here. This is this is the first time we've really had someone knowledgeable about CephaFest, which is Well, I, I sometimes have a conflict with this meeting. Or I usually have a conflict with this meeting, but not today. Okay. Well um, cool. This is... I'll try to make these more frequently because I, I think that conflict will not be as in the future. Nice. All right. Um, well, let's see. Is there anything else? I don't think I've got anything else, guys. I'll open it up. Anyone have anything they want to talk about in the last 15 minutes here? I guess just going back to that um, QSPR for um, the NDS, Patrick, um, they also mentioned they had, as for testing, they had implemented around um, MDS, like thrashing, essentially. Sounded like. Um, I don't know if you, have you looked through like, their presentation about this. It looked pretty interesting. By the the MDSDM clock, folks. Yeah. No, I wasn't aware they did a presentation. They had linked the slides in their latest comment there. Maybe it's worth looking through these in a future okay. uh, performance call or something. Here's a link. I see. Okay, I'll take a look at that. I will I will say that um that if we can fix some of the QoS problems in CephaFest, that was um the other big thing I noticed in the IO five hundred tests is that we were having some clients uh completing much, much earlier than others. And I think not necessarily strictly due to just like like weird balancer issues or other things. Um even with like ephemeral pinning. Well, that was also a separate problem. But I think QoS also played into this where um, the more we can make things even, the better we're going to do on that, that test. Yeah, QoS is just actually a, a tricky thing to get right in CephaFS because <clears throat> up to this point, clients have been unrestricted in how much work they give the MDS through RPC calls. And because messages are necessarily ordered between the client and the MDS, if the MDS needs to ask the client to release something from its cache or release a capability so that it can do work on behalf of another client. Um, it may first have to chew through a number of messages from that client 
before it can get to that, that cap release that the client is giving back to the MDS. And so um, bolting on QoS onto the, the MDS is, is tricky business because you have the potential for, for creating deadlocks. Um, so in some ways we need to you know, take a detailed look at the clients and, and they, they definitely need to participate in this QoS nicely so that they're not um, you know, creating these deadlock situations by, for example, giving the MDS too much work. And we have to provide legacy support. And it, it, it's not simple. Um, but I have not, again, taken a detailed look at this PR, so I'm not exactly sure what they've, they've done yet. Thanks. Thanks. That's an interesting, Patrick. I wasn't aware of the protocol limitations there. Yeah, it's definitely a hard problem, even for a simpler protocol like the OSDs. I mean, we're only just now um, starting to get to the point where we can uh, implement and, and test the client versus client QoS and Rados. I wonder if we'll get to a point soon where we would only need to put the metadata pool on a separate set of OSDs. The MDS can have appropriate quality of ser service guarantees, then we can just use the same set of SSDs for all of all the pools that need to use SSD storage. Yeah, I'd imagine so if we had SSDs everywhere, like you said. Even in that scenario, though, I mean, the tests I was doing, the OSDs were not always working particularly hard. There were a couple of cases where we pushed them hard, but not, not in the cases where we were really slow. The real danger is having the data pool also on the using the same set of OSDs with the MDS pool, uh, pools because the data pool can easily be overwhelmed by aggressive clients. And if they're on the same set of OSDs, the metadata will slow down dramatically. And it just has that, that just affects everything then. What, but what generally, we ever... often see that the data pool is set on our disk drives. But now, you know, these days, it's very common to see all SSD set clusters. And so, you know, there's no guarantees anywhere. You can't make assumptions, which is why we we just have default advice of putting the the, Ceph meta, the CephFS metadata pool on its own set of SSDs that are exclusively for CephFS. When you when you do that, so if you so if you just have SSDs, your or NVMe drives, let's say, and you separate out the metadata pool to be on a different set of OSDs than the data pool in this case, did you ever figure out what the limitation was in that scenario that was actually like causing the metadata pool to be more latent or slow? You mean like? Um, you mean without separating the the group of OSDs? So here, let me rephrase it. Um, say you've got a bunch of NVMe drives, and you can either dedicate all of those for both data and for metadata, or you could split them so that only some of them are serving data and some of them are serving metadata. It is is your contention, or, or sorry, is your 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 observation that it's better to split some of those away just for metadata? I haven't seen numbers for NVMEs, so I, I can't say whether it's necessary in that particular case. But I imagine okay. that even with NVMEs, the OSDs could be overwhelmed by, by clients doing large read and write workloads on OSDs, especially for a smaller cluster, in which case the, you know, the MDS is not getting any kind of priority treatment from the OSDs. So even simple things like writing to the journal to record, you know, file opens and closes and cap updates would be slowed down. You know, even by a few milliseconds can have broad implications for the performance of CephFS overall. That's when I, like when a, I was... a good argument for making sure that uh, Rios QoS works well for CephFS clients. To be able to control that priority between that, that metadata server activity and the client activity. Yeah, and especially for um, edge clusters where the number of OSDs is not, you know, you only have a few OSDs, but they do have 
you know, cutting edge hardware like NVMEs, um, you know, it's even more important to make sure that in, uh, you know, we don't need to carve out a, a number of OSDs for the, for the metadata pool. Right, right. What, what I was seeing during the IO500 tests is that the, the really hard tests, the OSDs seem to not actually be doing a whole lot. It was kind of like we had a lot of contention on like a single MDS, like the, an authoritative MDS. Um, even in like the ephemeral pinning tests where you are doing like this round robin stuff. Um, I mean, the OSDs were working harder, but not as hard as they can work. Um, it, it looked to me more like what we saw was that you'd end up with certain MDSs hitting their their kind of uh, inherent limit, which is like maybe 20,000 IAPs or something around that, that, that uh, level of performance. And then others end up with a lower number of uh, subdirectories, or maybe I don't remember how you've changed it at this point, but um, they, they have a, a a smaller proportion of the work to do just by random, you know, bell curve distribution, and end up. Well, um, I think you know, for that slower. particular test, the problem was the subtree map. The authoritative MDS had a, a ridiculously large subtree map, and again, it comes back to that problem I was discussing earlier with Sage, where it has to write the subtree map for every it, journal segment. Exactly. And exactly. A lot of the operations required synchronous updates to the the journal and every time it wrote a new segment out it had to write the subtree map out which was why the authoritative MTS was so slow and it was affecting the performance of the other MTSs. Yeah I guess I have not yet observed a behavior on this kind of hardware where it's just all really fast where the OSDs like between the the data and the metadata on the same OSD spread across the whole cluster has been obviously the bottleneck. Doesn't mean it isn't, but it just hasn't been like really clearly that's what's you know slowing things down yet. I think it's most obvious when you run when you put the metadata pool on hard disk drives as well. Um, sure. It's absolutely you know, we don't regularly hear about these problems. Um, when I do Testing on Linode, I, I I still put the uh, OSD, the metadata OS, have a separate set of metadata OSDs because I actually do see the problems when I when I'm doing it something with like a 16 or even 32 OSD cluster, uh, and they're on enterprise SSDs even though they're VMs. Um, I can easily, you know, create slowdowns by doing a, a large workload with like 64 or 128 clients all hitting the CFS cluster in that case. Um, all of the metadata is, is awesome. on the map? No. The, no. Metadata, the CFS journal is uh, is all um, blob store and objects and... Okay. Um, but the directories, the directory objects are all OMAP. And then there's a few other um, data structures, which I believe are blob stores. Um, the open file table is another example of an OMAP store that the, the MDS uses. Did you did you happen to notice what looked like was slowing down more if it was uh, OMAP or or data accesses, object accesses? No, I don't think I checked what was the exact cause of the low metadata ops. Usually I found out after the OSD started dying or something. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> yeah, I mean the, the nice thing about Linode is it's easy to make a, a you know even a large cluster for cheap, but you know unless you're willing to you know you can make VMs with a lot of memory, but then you have to start shelling out more money, which I try not I try to avoid doing. So it's easier to just take a few OSDs and use them for metadata. Um, I don't care if the data reads and writes are slow, but the metadata, you know, can't yeah. be slow. Yeah, it's another thing about, like, with BlueStore having, uh, usually being deployed with the SSD for RocksDB, if the most important metadata is in OMAP, uh, then you might not even need full SSD uh, OSDs everywhere. 
Josh, this might be another argument too to um, let BlueFS actually write out hot objects to the fast device instead of always putting them on the block device, flow device, or whatever we want to call it. Yeah, yeah. I guess we talked about a couple different strategies there, either for hot objects or for tiny objects, by kind of using put put some some things on the uh, fast storage. It's the same thing the Intel guys want to do with uh, with their open CAS is just shoving that underneath the OSD and letting it figure it out. Um, so I, I don't want us to go down a huge rabbit hole of optimizations we can do. I think mostly we just need to try out the new QoS features of the of the OSD with in this particular scenario of a small Ceph cluster and if that works, then we can make appropriate recommendations in the documentation. But otherwise, I, I don't think it requires a lot of, you know, a, a lot of detail. Sorry. Um, I, I don't think we need to investigate this too much. The, you know, just separating off a few OSDs in a large cluster for metadata is not a is not a huge ask for for the large production clusters we know of, like at CERN. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Especially when you you probably have a bit of a different uh, memory profile for those nodes as well. Yeah. Anyway, I got to run to a conflict, so um, hopefully I'll see you all next week or sometime in the future, depending on if that other meeting conflict continues. Okay, sure. I nice to see conflict. you, Patrick. Anyway, it's not uh, too uh, explosive. <laughs> Make it, it makes it sound like a giant argument or something. <laughs> <laughs> it is a giant argument. <laughs> what? I miss what? <laughs> What are we? Well, what are we right now to a conflict, so it sounds like an argument to me. Oh, it's, sure. it's, it's a horrible <laughs> conflict. Medieval. All right. See you guys. All right. See you later. See you. Bye. All right. We're we're at the end of the hour anyway. So any anything else, guys? Nope. All right. Then have a great week. See you later, everyone. Thanks. See you. See you. Thank you, guys. Bye.